Kim Dong Wook. My name is Jungwoo Kim, and I'm the co-director of NACASEC, the host of this new series. Welcome to Why Asians Should Care. Yeah. Well, today we'll be talking about the fight for citizenship for all. What we mean when we say citizenship for all, and more importantly, why Asians should care about these issues. Uh, hi, my name is Esther. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a community member with Nakasek. I'm also an undocumented immigrant myself. I came to the United States when I was a young child with my family and currently reside in the great city of Houston, Texas, um, which is where Hyundai Sanjinim and the rest of the Uri Junto staff work really, really hard to make sure that our growing Asian American voice in the state is loudly heard. Hi, my name is Hyunja Noma. Hello, hello. I'm very happy to speak in Korean, so I'm going to do it in English. My name is Hyunja Sinhyunja. I live in Houston and I live in Uri Huntos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to say it. I'm also documented. Yeah, I'm DACA recipient. Yes, uh, people call me DACA grandpa because when I first got DACA, I was I think I was a little younger, 20 years, but now almost 40. So that's how long this program and nothing changed. Um, yeah, and also I use he him pronouns as well. Yeah, although Tongwu Adoshi is actually my undocumented hube because I became undocumented first. So he owes me respect in that manner. How long have you been undocumented? Longer than you. <laughs> Damn, man, it's 23 years right here. Oh, maybe a little younger, like two, three years longer, right? But you, oh, yeah, I respect you, sir. Yes. Well, maybe the first questions I'd like to ask is maybe history of citizenship for all and why citizenship for all? Uh, in our community, we do not talk about uh, undocumented community members. Okay. Generally, we do not talk about this. Okay, But uh, for me, uh, citizenship is very important. Without citizenship, we cannot live here fully and safely. Can you imagine in Texas, you have to go somewhere to work or study, but you do not have a driver license because you do not have a citizenship. That is a, uh, that really make people very difficult to live here in Texas. So small things like that, without citizenship. Also, ah, what can I say? Just security. You cannot be. You always have to uh, think about. Can I go home today safely <laughs> after work? You know, uh, if we, if you are not undocumented. That kind of thing is easy. Uh, really difficult for folks. I met some people at church uh, who do not have a citizenship. So, but our church does not provide that kind of supporting system. That is really. Uh, so, somehow, yeah. Uh, very difficult. So I like to help people who do not have citizenship. That is how I come to this movement, especially our community members. Uh, yeah. What really comes to mind for me is that illegality has always been a really, really convenient tool for the U.S. government to use to subjugate and oppress immigrants in this country. It is very, very easy to say those people are illegal, thus they are undeserving of human rights in this country, than to kind of skirt around, oh, well, they're 
brown or Asian or black, which is the real reason why they believe that we shouldn't have citizenship here. Um, and so I think first it's always sort of important to recognize why it is that so many of us are suffering without the basic human rights that we deserve. And I think very broadly, citizenship for all, of course, is a pathway to citizenship for all 11 million undocumented immigrants. Um, and we are very emphatic about the all. That means um, all people of color, people particularly who may have histories with incarceration, people who might not be thought of as deserving of citizenship in the first place. So that might mean people with disabilities, people who don't speak English very well, um, people who are older and therefore might not be able to contribute the amount of labor that the US government wants to see us contribute. Um, but I think more intimately and personally, citizenship for all is our right to live a dignified life in this country. Um, I think dignity is a word I think a lot about as an immigrant here. The lengths that the government and politicians put us through for basic survival in this country, I think, is ridiculous. Um, and I know something, this is something that Adashi and other people in office have, have thought a lot about, um, how important it is to create conditions where immigrants aren't just surviving and laboring for basic needs, but thriving. Like being able to think beyond our immediate necessities and dream really, really big about what can be possible here. So I just, yeah, just some of the thoughts I had about the citizenship for all stuff. And Adishi, you should also share your thoughts on what citizenship for all means. For me, I had a, okay, it's much easier than take out all the citizenship for, from white people than give them citizenship to a people of color. So I think citizenship for all is, makes sense. I mean, think about it. I studied the history, right? When I study study the history of how America was started, basically what they did is they, they took the ship from you know west, and then they arrive here. They just claim it, right? And up until almost beginning of 1900, it's people people were white they just came to the United States. They just stamp it, right? Um, what is your name? You know, they shared white people's name. Was, okay, you look white. Okay, look like me. And they stamp it. Okay, yeah, now you're a citizen of this uh, the country. And only if you look at the history, like Asian countries or some um, from other countries, like from like Latinx country, um, black country, black people's country, and they have a lot of restrictions. They put a lot of restrictions around ban, you know, prohibitions that so they can get obtained, um, even though just their status, even though they work here, you know, live here for years, years. So I think it's racist, yes, term, and also discrimination against people of color. That's why citizenship board makes sense. I think it's, people just see that as immigration, but it's not. It's like, uh, the system was created just to protect uh, um, people in power, which is mostly rich, white. <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, after I studied that, oh, it really makes sense. Yeah, and this immigration system itself was already messed up from, from the beginning. So, uh, and it would, I think I'm not just, when, when I say citizenship for my personal term, I'm not just asking for the paper, I'm just asking, changing the, um, the definition of immigration, yeah, which is, um, it's, yeah, which is like people who live in this country, um, no matter who they are, I think just like Esther share, they have they need to their life needs to be respected and, and dignity and um and they need to thrive. Yes. But without the proper paper, they can't do that. So uh um yeah, that is what I meant when I say citizenship for all. Yeah. And sorry, I'm talking so much, but I just see something that you were saying sort of like brought this up to mind for me that in a lot of ways, citizenship itself is actually an exclusionary tool as well. And I think that's 
one criticism we've heard before about our citizenship for all campaign that even this idea of citizenship upholds the notion of um, borders of the nation state about a specific idea of who deserves rights within a country to which I say that is completely valid but I think we also believe that citizenship for all is a method of harm reduction um, realistically we won't be able to abolish borders by tomorrow we actually probably can't get citizenship for all by tomorrow either um, but I think it's one sort of method of harm reduction we can organize for um, until we can sort of go for our bigger more visionary goals around um, abolishing borders, pursuing the freedom to move across the world. Um, so yeah, I think you bring up a really important point there that even citizenship itself, the roots of how it was constructed, um, weren't so great either, definitely, yeah. And Chanda Sanzing, I was wondering, you mentioned earlier that you really want people in your community to know more about this issue. In your experience as you've organized in Texas, what have you found works well in helping other Korean immigrants understand why this is important? Like, are there any talking points or things you share with them that help them to really feel the urgency of this issue? Mm -hmm. Our community, uh, generally they are uh, not interested in these issues. But when we talk about our people, our Korean Americans, are affected by these issues. Then they think, oh, really? Then, then they, Korean adoptees do not have citizenship. Then they think, oh, really? <laughs> it comes like this. So we have to talk about how many people are undocumented, how many Korean adoptees do not have citizenship, and fighting for their citizenship, how many years? then people have a compassion, okay? Then we have to think, this is not only my issue, our issues, this is Asian issues and Latino issues, Black American issues, Haitian issues. Then people come, when they know about these kind of things, when we talk about this, they know about more and they, then they, understand and then they try to help a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like to say. <laughs> First generation is this much selfish. <laughs> yeah, that was really good, Kanda Santini. And I think that you brought up a really important group of people that often get lost in this conversation, which is inner country adoptees as well. You mentioned sort of briefly that there are a lot of Korean adoptees without citizenship in this country. Um, do you want to share a little bit more about that? I think uh, more than 30, 30 or 40,000 uh, adoptees, inter-country inter uh, inter adoptees, they are fighting for citizenship, right? Uh, so many people, uh, I think a Korean's uh, majority. So when I met one of Korean adoptees here in Houston, uh, she was uh, trying to organize it, bring issues because she did not have citizenship. But she was adopted, adopted in this country when she was young uh, into American family. That is really... <laughs> How, how come that kind of can happen, right? But somehow along the way, parents did not know they have to do this kind of process. When you bring someone, uh, someone from outside the country, you have to go same process, like uh, uh, becoming a permanent resident and then apply for citizenship. But parents did not know this process. so. So, but somehow, uh, the Korean adoptees, many are now uh, over 40 and 50 and 60. They really need a uh, uh, supporting system, right? But they are undocumented. That is why they cannot get access to anything of these uh, services and benefits. That is, that is really uh, hurting our community, I think.
Thank you, Hyun-Jin. I have a question to Hyun. Uh, how do you, can you map, can you share your experience also, whatever the things, how much, you know, whatever you remember, about how the citizenship or conversation started, right? Um, and what was your experience of going through that conversations um, and, and also the transition from the immigrant rights movement from like young people, good immigrant oriented to more inclusive campaign? Um, I mean, I think we are still good immigrant oriented as a movement, unfortunately. And I think it comes up in really interesting ways. Um, obviously, there is this sort of emphasis on um, displaying our achievements to say that we are deserving of citizenship in this country. So oftentimes for DACA recipients, that might mean emphasizing that we're valedictorians. We speak English really well. We contributed X, Y, Z things to this country and thus, you know, we're the perfect Americans that the government is looking for. Um, but I've also seen really sort of interesting ways that people try to relinquish where they come from in pursuing citizenship here. So I'll hear some undocumented people say, I love football. I love apple pie. I'm so American. I barely remember anything about my home country. I have no ties whatsoever back home, which I think may be true for some people, um, but I think it's important to hold in this conversation that, for example, I'm undocumented, I live here in the United States, I would like to keep living here, um, but I'm also Korean, I have deep ties to my birth country, I have family and other relationships there that I continue to maintain, and my relationship with Korea is also important to me. Um, I find that that gets kind of lost, so for example, we might not tell politicians that one of the biggest reasons why I want citizenship is so that I can go visit Korea. <laughs> like I want to be able to get the legal status I can have to be able to go visit Korea and ensure that I can come back to the United States, that there would be no hiccups in my travel back to this country. Um, politicians don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that the reason why we want some of this is so that we can move more freely or even return to our home country. They want to hear that we've essentially forsaken our ethnic identity in some form to be the perfect American that they're looking for. Um, and so I, I do think there is this element of um, ethnic identity that gets really reduced um, in asking for citizenship here in the United States. But to this point about good immigrant versus bad immigrant, I think this binary is one of the greatest struggles of our immigrant justice movement. Um, I know within not the like we specifically began to talk about citizenship for all after fall of 2017. So during that time, which is actually when I first found out about Nakasek, um, Nakasek hosted a 22 day 24 seven vigil in front of the White House in anticipation of the Trump administration's termination of DACA, um, which was really exciting for me to see. I, you know, been undocumented for a long time, but I'd rarely ever seen an Asian and Korean groups specifically so visible in this work, like literally in front of the White House, dancing, singing, drumming, being really, really loud. Um, the drumming was a big thing for me. I love the drums. Um, and so that was really exciting for me to see. And I think sort of began Nakasek's really deep grassroots approach to the organizing that we were doing. Um, after Trump did terminate DACA, then um, Congress, was trying to pass a legislative solution in response during that winter. And that was a really, really difficult time. Uh, most of that time was spent amongst undocumented people trying to decide what bills we would accept and what bills we would reject. And that's a really hard conversation to have, to sit amongst your community, your people, and have to talk amongst yourselves, like which bill would exclude too many of us? Um, what are we willing to give up? What are we going to hold true to? Um, and I think the closer you get to the possibility of winning or attaining something, the harder and scarier it gets to say no to some of the possibilities that are on the table, even if they might not be the best ones for our community. Um, ultimately, we didn't 
pass anything during that time. Um, as usual, Congress, they are a bunch of cowards, and they didn't have the political courage it took to make sure that undocumented immigrants um, would not become deportable again, specifically those with DACA. Um, and I think that was what sort of spawned our, we're sick of this sort of weird thing Congress does where they pit us against each other and make us try to figure out who amongst us is deserving of citizenship. Um, we're going to say we don't want that. We reject your efforts to divide our community. We're going to ask for all of it. We're going to ask for citizenship for all of us. We're going to ask that people with histories of incarceration get citizenship too. Like, y'all brought this upon yourselves by doing this to us. We're going to go all in and ask for all of it. Um, and it's been really exciting to see the immigrant justice movement kind of adopt the mantra of citizenship for all 11 million um, in the years that followed um, and the work we've done. I know we're at time. Um, and so I wanted to ask for, I guess, final thoughts. And in doing so, if maybe all three of us could directly respond to the question, why Asians should care? Uh, of our community members uh, directly impacted. Uh, we don't know, <laughs> maybe this is a, will be very surprise for many people, but is one in eight, one in seven Asian Americans is undocumented. Also, one of every six undocumented people are Asians. So it means 16% uh, of undocumented immigrant population, um, Asians are 16%. That means that a lot of people, maybe they, you cannot hear that they, they come up to, I am undocumented, but a lot of people, so I can see, uh, for my, for my part is this, when I, cause somehow I got connected to our Taka, Korean recipient, right? I ask them, uh, can you uh, apply, can you share this DACA scholarship information with your friends? Then they say, they do not know anyone because they do not share this kind of information with other people. When I hear that, I was very uh, saddened, you know? We do not have, among us, we do not have a supporting system and friend. You do not, you do not have friend to talk your problem, your, um, your struggles. That is really um, hot. Okay. So that is why I can bring, uh, I can, okay, we can be a space for uh, for these young people who can talk about their struggles and dreams and their inspiration, aspiration, whatever, you know. Why should Asians should care about citizenship for all is because there's so many undocumented immigrants are Asians, including if you look around your friends, or your neighbor, maybe or your family members. Uh, um, and why not? I want to ask anyone who wants to ask me that question, I want to ask, why not then? Why not citizenship for all? Why not also Asians should not care about it? You tell me, why not? I think first, it's really important that our community recognizes that there is a deep history here. Um, Asian Americans were the first group of people that the U.S. government legally excluded from immigrating into this country. It has been the long history and tradition of the U.S. government to find ways to make us deportable and exclude us from being able to live in this country safely and freely, as Hyundai something you mentioned. Um, two, I think there's a larger conversation about uh, war in U.S. imperialism here, um, thinking about how U.S. imperialism in our continent of Asia has really driven um, big groups of migration to the United States. I think that's a whole big other conversation in and of itself, so I won't get too into it, but thinking about the way that the United States um, intervenes in other countries and how that manifests and why we come to this country and continue to suffer here in the United States. 
And I think three, it's really important for us to remember that though we talk about immigration in really big systemic ways, um, immigration is a really intimate thing. It impacts our identity, our mental health, how we move through space and time, our relationships with people. I know so many people in the Korean community who, because the process of immigration was so traumatic, really struggle with living with their partners, um, struggle to raise their children with the kind of free love and care that they might have been able to do if not for the stresses that immigration has placed on their lives. Um, being undocumented is just another one of the traumas that comes with immigrating to this country. And so my hope is that other Asian Americans recognize that this is an intimate trauma that we all share and that it's important for us to be there for each other through this, especially considering um, the kind of hate I shouldn't say hate, the very explicit racism and xenophobia that Asian Americans have had to deal with, um, particularly following the COVID pandemic. Um, and so I guess in closing, thank you so much again to Tanda Tanzini and Chungwa Adishi for joining this conversation with us today. Um, I know Chungwa Adishi says he's young, but to me both, they are my organizing elders and I'm really proud and happy to have been able to be in conversation with them today. <laughs>